We have three messages that are about the great commandment. That's what we'll read. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And then we have three messages after that about the great commission. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded. And surely I am with you till the end of the age. The great commandment and the great commission put together, that's that's our marching orders, that's our mission, that's our purpose, that's what we're supposed to be doing as followers of Jesus Christ, as Christians, as church. And as Kristen said last week, I'm not going to let her steal my thunder completely. Yes, I'm excited about this too. Uh, I'm excited because, because what I've noticed in church world is that churches, perhaps as churches tend to do, mimicking the business world and the corporate world, they get together and they get the best and brightest minds in the room for uh, at a meeting or, or a retreat or something like that, and they say, we, we need a mission statement. We need something that says what, who we are and what we're supposed to do, and goodness, I agree with that. I couldn't agree with that more. I think God has already taken care of that, though. I think our mission is the Great Commandments and the Great Commission. I think our mission is to love them. Go. So that's what we're doing. You perhaps remember, um, one of the things that I appreciated uh, with Kristen um, was that in uh, reminding you, introducing to you the Great Commandment, she she showed you where it came from. She, she, she told you to do Deuteronomy 6, uh, the Shema, the, the oft-repeated, twice-repeated in that text. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second part of it, though, the part that Jesus added when the teacher of the law uh, questioned him, attempting to test him, most people will say, uh, that happened right before the passage that Will read. Um, Jesus added this, this little phrase, and love your neighbor as yourself. So taking a cue from Kristen, I want to take you to where that comes from. That comes from... Leviticus, Levit Leviticus 19.8, 18 rather, Leviticus 19.18, uh, the first part of it says, do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against one of your people, but love your Lord as yourself, or love your neighbor as yourself, sorry, I am the Lord, I kind of chopped that up pretty good, so let me read it again. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against one of your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Now, if you were to go back, and if you were to, uh, I'd say, read most of Leviticus 19, maybe a little bit before that even, you would see, well, actually all kinds of commandments. You would see all kinds of my title says Various Laws, Instructions, Torah, that sort of thing. Um, and if you were to read over those, I think what you would find is that this is all about loving your neighbor. This is all about loving your neighbor. And so 1918 is actually kind of a summary. Um, if you read them all, you would see, you might would notice that they're... Loving your neighbor it kind of gives a little bit more explanation, right? To, it would include things like sharing with the poor and sharing with the foreigner. Compassion, absolute honesty and justice in our relationships with others. Impartiality, a refusal to be party to gossip or to slander, an absence of malice toward anyone. Refusal to hold a grudge or bear a grudge. Taking care never to put another person's life at risk and never taking private vengeance against another one. It's also interesting to note here that when we have an issue with anyone, this is where we find uh, the concept of when we have an issue with someone, we're supposed to go right to that person. We should strive to make it right by going to him or her directly. James later will call, will call much of Leviticus 19 and the things you find in Leviticus 19 the royal law. Jesus said, yes, these are the... These are the two laws that sum up all of the laws and all of the prophets. 
Very similar when Jesus also said in the Sermon on the Mount that we should have, uh, that we should do to others as we would have them do to us. And really, that's all rooted right here. Now, if you're with me, and if you heard all the things here I just said about what it all is involved in loving your neighbor, maybe you're thinking, I'm thinking, well, we have a lot of work to do. We have a lot of work to do, and and so uh, the series is Love Then Go. But but really, just these first two messages. Um, well, the go part is going to be the remaining four messages. The response to God's love and how we live out God's love. Next week will be all about loving your neighbor. The final three about will be about going. But, but it seems to me, and Kristen said this last week too, that before we do that or before we talk about that, that we have a little bit of internal work to do before we can go out. We need to look in just a bit. So, so I was thinking, um, love your neighbor as yourself. It occurred to me, I think, that I don't, I don't believe I have ever spent a whole lot of time, certainly not in a preaching or teaching section uh, session, paying attention or focusing on that little phrase, as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. And I was thinking, well, why is that? Well, you know, I think, I think in most of my sermon work and most of my trying to listen to the Spirit so that I can tell you what I think I'm hearing, um, I don't think we have any trouble with that. I don't think we have any trouble. Well, certainly I preached about love a lot. Um, I preached a, a, a sermon series last summer about love and how we act out love. And at that time, I told you that love is seeking to meet and fulfill the needs, concerns, interests, and goods, good of others above our own, no matter the cost. So I suppose my working assumption has been that we, that we do love ourselves, that, that we don't need a whole lot of pep talk around that area. We got that down pretty well, and as a matter of fact, we need to take the focus off ourselves. We need to move from self-centeredness to other-centeredness. And I, and I think that's the assumption of the Bible, too, to tell you the truth, because, because I studied, as I studied for this particular message, I really wanted to see, well, what are others saying about that little phrase, as yourself, love your neighbor as yourself, and that, that's, that's more or less what they said, too. That is the Bible's assumption. That we have no problem loving ourselves. I read another definition this week of love. Love is an unconditional commitment to an imperfect person in which one gives oneself to another to bring the relationship to God's intended purpose. Love is an unconditional commitment to an imperfect person which one gives oneself, in which one gives oneself to another to bring the relationship to God's intended purpose. So, again, talking about love and what is love, it's, it's you see the trajectory? The tra trajectory is out. The trajectory is to love others. We, we have this working assumption, knowledge, default, that when it comes to thinking about ourselves, well, that's, that's where we start and, and take that and then love others that way. So I thought about that a lot this week. And I thought, you know, um, maybe, probably, that's true, probably for the most part, the word we need to hear consistently is to move from self-centeredness to other-centeredness. But you know, one of the things that's interesting now and uh, I suppose this season of my preaching life is that as part of my research, I've told you that I read commentaries and studies, other sermons, that sort of thing every week. But now I'm noticing one of the things that I also do is I, I, I go back and I look at what I've done before. And if there's a topic or a passage of scripture, I don't repeat it, but I, but I go back and see, well, what, what was I talking about then? And how did it fit with that context? And 
does it have anything to bear or any word that might be good now? And, and you know, this series we just finished in Exodus, one of the studies was about idols. Remember that? The golden calf that wrapped up the series. And, and so as part of, well, what I said, going back and looking, I found a series I did with teenagers, with young people, um, where the title was American Idols. Isn't that clever? And um, I, I spent like four or five weeks talking to them about idols. And, and I found a particular message. What I did, it appears, um, I've slept since then, so I had to review, but, but one week I spoke primarily to the, the, the girls. One week I spoke primarily to the guys, the fellas, and the sermons were different. I said, you know, when a girl walks by the mirror, um, she notices because she pays so much attention to the magazines and what the world is telling her, she notices all the blemishes, all the imperfection. A guy walks by the mirror and says, hey, you're good looking, it keeps going. <laughs> so we can see what the idols are and how they're different, right? Well, what I was reminded of in reviewing that is that, you know, actually, there's a good segment of us that probably needs to be reminded that we are to love ourselves. And I don't think, I don't think that's just teenage girls, right? I think... Uh, as we get older, right, uh, that gets manifested in other ways, but what is at the root of having a hard time accepting ourselves, what is at the root of struggling with self-worth or self-approval or self-esteem is insecurity. <laughs> so we get older and we're better at it. We hide behind things like titles and we hide behind things like tasks and we think our title or the task define us, give us identity, make us who we are, because, because if those titles and those tasks give us identity, make us who we are, we don't have to think too hard about who we really think we are, and how much insecurity we really have, and, and if I need to do any more convincing that this idea of struggling with our self-worth isn't just reserved for young people, I mean, just look at the news. It was just last year, two years ago, right? Something like that. Somebody as visible and as prominent as Robin Williams taking his own life. And to take your own life, is there any, is there any more clear of an illustration of what I'm trying to talk about here? You know, I, I found some interesting things about that, actually. Um, again, maybe if I, if I bring that up, suicide, taking one's own life... Yes, maybe similarly, we think maybe about young people, okay? And certainly, for those 15 to 24, it is the second leading cause of death behind accidents, behind unnatural uh, events. But, according to the CDC, the highest increase in suicide from 2000 to 2014, males 50 and over. The suicide rates for females are highest among those 45 to 54. And the suicide rates for males are highest among those aged 75 and above. Certainly this is, uh, maybe that's helping us to say, well, it's not just reserved for young people. Um, but we know it's not, right? Somebody who's been abused or somebody who's been neglected or somebody who has been bullied, certainly struggles with loving themselves. And I am not trying to turn this into, I don't know, some kind of Dr. Phil session this morning or anything like that. But I think what happens when you have those feelings of being neglected or being abused, or if you've been neglected or if you've been abused or if you've been bullied, then there is no question those can have long-term, lasting effects over the course of of an entire lifetime. They resurface, don't they? And there's triggers for them, isn't there? They impact your relationships. They affect self-image and they affect self-esteem, like I said, over the course of a lifetime. So again, I am, I am, there's no couch here. I am not trying to get into the world of psychology or 
psychiatry or whatever it is, but but I do read this a lot, or I try to anyway, a fair amount. And here's what this says. Matter of fact, if we're talking about loving and going, and if we're talking about our need to love others, Scripture says we love because God first loved us. Scripture says this is love, that He sent His one and only Son as an atoning sacrifice of our sins. Scripture says, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Scripture says that there is nothing, nothing in all of creation that can ever separate the Father's love from you. You are love. That's four scriptures. I could give you about 400 more. You are love. The psalmist, the psalmist talks about abiding love. The psalmist talks about steadfast love. It's like they're searching for words and eloquence to try to frame and to try to describe for the readers and for the worshiping community how great God's love is for you. That's what I'm trying to do. And you know what? It, it could be that you've heard this before. God loves you? Really? Pastor? Preacher? That's the best you got today? Well, okay, I I think scripture speaks for itself. I really do. But, but here's, what, here's what all of those scriptures about God's love means. When you compete and when you lose, you're loved. When your dreams are shattered, you're loved. When your spirit is crushed, you're loved. When your heart is broken, you're loved. When all hope seems lost, you are loved. Amen. I don't know. I don't know if it's because it's something we can get our minds around, God loves us, or if it's something we've heard before, or maybe it's because it is so well repeated in here. I, I really am very interested this morning, though, in trying to communicate how deep the Father's love for us is and how much you are loved. I think, actually, um, one of the very, very best scriptures on this idea is Psalm 139. O oh Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O oh Lord. You hem me in. Behind and before, you have laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful to me for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light will become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. You created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days adorned ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, O oh God, how vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of the sand. Where when I awake, I am still with me. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way.
away in me and lead me in a life everlasting. Once again, Scripture is fully capable of speaking for itself. But, like I said, one of the things I do is I go back and see some of the things I've done before. And when I did a search for Psalm 139, well, I found a letter that I wrote. It was a letter I wrote in 2008. It was a letter I wrote to my mom. And I'm going to try to get through it. Because if I think if there's ever a word for someone who might be wondering if they're loved, well, that's the word. But here's, here's what I said. Mama. I'm sitting in my room at a retreat center in Baltimore, Maryland. I'm on a Bethany Fellowship retreat, and it is our day of silence, the day when we are supposed to tend to our souls and still be and, and be still enough to hear the voice of God. So I'm writing letters. Judging by your last email, it sounds as if you've been doing some of that yourself. I apologize for not responding sooner, but you asked some pretty deep questions and you were having some pretty deep thoughts, and I wanted to pray about my response. I've done that. I wrote a paragraph on two separate days in my prayer journal, and during a long prayer walk this afternoon, I prayed that God would give me words for you. He has, and here they are. God loves you. Passionately. Intimately. Deeply. Like no one else ever has, and like no one else ever will, and like no one else ever can. Can you do me a favor? Before you read this email any further, can you go get your Bible? You know, the one with all your old bulletins, locks of hair, handwritten notes. I love that Bible. Grab it and turn to Psalm 139. Let's walk through that together. You ask, do you think or were you taught that I'm a normal person? Do you think that God knows? Psalm 139 says, O Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You are familiar with all my ways, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. That is one of my favorite passages of Scripture. It is such an awesome, eloquent reminder of the fact that God made us, and God loves his creation passionately, intimately, and deeply. More than that, though, and more to the heart of your questioning, he knows us. He knew us in the womb. He knew us years ago. He knows us now. And here's the really crazy, cool thing, Mom. God knows us, and He still loves us. Crazy, isn't it? Well, let me replace the word us and insert another word. Jana, that's her name. God knows Jana, and He loves Jana. Consider the words of that same psalm with this slight substitution. O Lord, you have searched Jan, and you know Jan. You are familiar with all of Jan's ways. For you created Jan as inmost being. You knit Jan together in her mother's womb. Jan praises you because she is fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. Pretty powerful stuff. When you say that's not the word, that's the word of God, not my word, God's word, directly to Jan. And then I kind of wrap it up by saying, that brings me to this, Jesus calls us friend. In John 15, 9 through 17, Jesus says, I have called you friend. And one of the reasons I love God so much is that he tells us he is our friend. Friendship has made a major impact on my life. It's one of the main ways God reveals his passionate, deep, and intimate love to me. So the fact that in addition to mama, I get to call you friend, well, I cannot tell you how much that means to me helps remind me that God loves me. In conclusion, I'm pretty sure I did not give you any words of wisdom or any strategic advice, but as you continue to wonder what's going on and what's happening to you, I just wanted you to be reminded that God loves you. And I do So much. Always have. Always will. If you're wondering, if you've ever wondered, like my mom did, if you're loved, you are. Now, when I texted her to ask if I could have permission to share that, she said yes, and she said, I love that you want to share that with your peeps. I love that my mom used the word peeps. <laughs> <laughs> and then 
she went on to talk about some of the things she's experienced since then. And how she feels like she's grown since then. That's how God's love works. You accept it, you believe it, you look back, and your life has changed. Let's pray. The invitation to God this morning was for all of us to think about ourselves as you think of us, beloved, fearful, wonderfully made, your workmanship. It's like you've got all these little masterpieces in here, but so often the world and those around us, they tell us, they describe us as anything. They tell us we're broken, ugly. Not worthy. But you look at us, and because we're created in your image, you do see, you do see your beloved. You do love us. So, Lord, for a message that is just simply about how great the Father's love is for us, I pray that won't just discard that fact. We won't just say, okay, got it. We won't just say, oh, I've heard that before. That we will experience your love. Allow it to shape us, mold us, transform us.